Welcome to Stream Detroit, the Big Digital Thinkers, Episode 7. I'm your host, Mike McClintock, with uh, our fabulous co-host, uh, what is your name again? Brad Fox. Brad Fox, but I'm channeling my inner David Lee Roth today. Oh, that is true, very much so. Our guest today is Matt Cardwell, the Director of Social Media at Quicken Loans. Thanks for coming on the show, Matt. How are you? I'm great. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Good. Excited to be here. Okay, cool. This is the uh, the first episode of NFL Free Agency that just started a few minutes ago. <laughs> now that we all do not, we don't have to say Indomitian Sue anymore, but the replacement name that we have to remember is Haloti Nada. Haloti Nada. That is the replacement. We got one bad name out the door, and we got a better yeah. crazy defensive tackle name. Haloti Nada. Haloti Nada. Can it's you say that? How's that spelled? I don't know, but it's, it's not about talent. It's apparently like you have to like, team. It's got an X and a Q. You have to carry the one. Does it really? Yeah. I don't even know. It's a lot. Haloti. What exactly, you know, does a director of social media do at a place like Quicken Loans? Quicken Loans is like, obviously they sell some mortgages, but it seems yeah. to me it's more like a software company that has a, a lot of media stuff and uh, a bunch of crazy fun shit going yeah. on. Yeah. And they happen to just, you know, sell some mortgages too. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think, you know, depending on, you know, who you talk to and, and, and when, you know, Dan, Dan Gilbert, the chairman and founder of Quicken Loans over the years has said, we're really not a mortgage company. We're a, a technology company that happens to do mortgages. And uh, at other times we've said, we're a marketing company that also, by the way, our product happens to be mortgages. And, and, and really, you know, it's, we're an HR company, you know, mm -hmm. we're a company that hires people that happens to do mortgages. And really at the end of the day, the, the, the whole idea behind that and the reason we say that, it's kind of funny, right? But it's also the fact is, is that you could take other businesses and put them into the model of what we do, right? Which is really about sort of people, technology and marketing. And um, with the right culture and the right group of people, you could you could kind of go do what we did with mortgages in a lot of different industries. And um, I, I would say, you know, at various times in the company's history, we've maybe had, you know, we, we've always had a very strong tradition of being a very, um, you know, a very technology forward company. Um, we, uh, you know, but, you know, at various times, we've also put more emphasis on the marketing side of things. We've had to put more emphasis on the hiring side of things. Um, and it's, you know, and it probably really comes down to people at the end of the day, I, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, so, you know, we've had to put em emphasis on that as well. And now you might say we're also, you know, in the business of closing loans to help buy buildings in Detroit and do something cool down here, right? Have they bought so, any buildings? Uh, I, I don't know what the latest one is. Mm -hmm. and, I, and if I did know, I probably couldn't tell you anyway. Right. But uh, yeah, there's a few of them down couple, there. So yeah, a couple, there. a couple, right? One next door that I know of, right? Madison yeah. building, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, um, so to your question about, you know, what is it, what is, what is a director of social media do? I, I mean, really, you know, what, you know, the great thing I have is I, I get to work in a very rapidly developing field. And, and mm -hmm. that's really the part that's exciting for me. I started, uh, I started at Quicken Loans about 10 years ago, um, leading the digital marketing team at that, at ta that time there was no social media. Right. Um, or, you know, the social media was bulletin boards, I guess. So you could argue mm -hmm. those were social. We were um, waiting for MySpace to come it, it, Yeah, exactly. They're right. And, and that came, you know, I, I don't know, probably, you know, a, a year or two after I joined the company. Mm -hmm. So we did, you know, we did primarily, uh, you know, we did websites, we did web content, we did search engine optimization, SEO, online ads. Alta Vista? Alt, uh, I think Alta Vista was gone by then. You know, it was, it was Google was still the big play. Um, I think yeah, Yahoo. Yeah, I guess you that's know, true. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Yahoo was, was, was you know, was kind of going in a different direction. It kind of like moved a little bit away from the search business at that time. And, um, and so did that for, for several years. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, uh, you know, had a great opportunity to lead marketing at Quicken Loans for a few years. And then uh, had an opportunity for uh, a little under two years to go over and work uh, on the private equity side and uh, work inside of a whole bunch of different companies. Um, and help them with marketing strategy, and then had this great opportunity to come back to social, back to Quicken Loans. Was this still when you were kind of on the private equity side? Was this still kind of within the Gilbert? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I was, uh, you, you know, I was, I was able to still, you know, the philosophy of the company is, is that you know, regardless of where you are inside of the family of companies, as we mm -hmm. call them, like you, you, you still have this great opportunity to be able to work across companies and across teams. And that's one of the things that, you know, has kept me at Quicken Loans for 10 years, because generally I get bored after about two, two and a half years, and I want to go do something different. And uh, I've never gotten bored. 
in large part because I've been able to work on so many different interesting things and you know being on the digital side of things things change so quickly mm -hmm. um, every day is different um, just when you start to think you have something figured out Google changes something in the algorithm Facebook rolls a new feature out snapchat comes out of the woodwork mm -hmm. Instagram blows up like whatever it is right there's always something going on so I just I'm a very I'm a person who really likes um, likes new things and 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 that's mm -hmm. why when I had an opportunity to come back into uh, Quicken Loans marketing uh, just about two years ago um, I was thrilled to come back and actually you know rebuild sort of and build up a team that was originally in my team back in 2006 and we had the first social media team as far back as as then and uh, it, it's 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 been amazing going at it kind of a second time mm -hmm. So what kind of people do you look for for that? I mean, if it's if it's constantly changing, it's not like you can say, well, I, I see you've got a ton of experience with MySpace here. I mean, nobody... And tripod. Yeah. And, and, and web crawl. Yeah, and right. It, it, we're right. And it's, and it's changed over tripod. the years. <laughs> tripod. Or, or, or GeoCities, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, it's interesting because we, um, you know, now everybody is a so... I say everybody, but most people consider themselves to be social media users, right? right. Um, you know, probably 75, 80% of, of, of U.S. households or Americans have a Facebook account now. It doesn't right. mean they're an active user. Um, it, it's, it's very different from 2006 mm -hmm. when, you know, this was an emerging area, right? My, MySpace was very young at the time. Facebook hadn't come out of the university yet. Right. Um, YouTube was just coming on the scene. Um, Twitter hadn't emerged yet. In fact, I remember um, it was a couple of months after South by Southwest. I don't remember the exact year. It might have been like 2006, probably, or seven, maybe. And uh, we said, hey, you know, like, what is this Twitter thing? Mm -hmm. We were having this conversation inside of the digital team. And should we be there? Oh, I don't know. You know, like, is it going to take off? Like, what are people even doing on there? Right. Like, what is this? Like, you know, and there was a tweet. Yeah. And they were calling and we made, made fun of it. Compose a tweet. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and they were calling it microblogging then. Right. Mm. And, mm -hmm. and so we said, well, you know, we don't really know, but let's get in there and let's at least, you know, claim our brand on it. And, you know, it's, it's turned out to be a major client, you know, care, and client service channel for us, um, you know, over the years. And, you know, we, we very early on staffed a person on it who mm -hmm. her job was to watch Twitter and monitor it for, you know, clients who might need help or whatever and then respond back. And so, so if I tweet you right now, if you tweet me right now, uh, well, if you tweet quick and loans right now, right. Uh, somebody will get back with you if you ask a question, right. or if you say I'm having I'm a problem. Quick and loans and ask them to ask me questions to ask. That you, you should do that, and then they'll get back. Somebody will get back will. with you. Yeah, and I won't. Yeah, go ahead and do that. They, they, if if they're if, if if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, you should get a response within <laughs> three to five minutes. And so. if not, we'll just edit it to make it. Look <laughs> yeah, exactly, better. exactly. Yeah, so it's the magic of the interweb. But it sounds like there's. It's not just about you know, broadcasting like, hey, we've got a new program or here's our new initiative. There's also a customer service aspect to Twitter that that Quicken is, you know, kind of using it as a channel for customer service. Oh, absolutely. And and, and I would say, if anything, that has been probably the area that we put the most focus on mm -hmm. and that we probably had the most staffing around. So right now, uh, we actually, we staff six people who's, um, it's not their full-time job, but they run dedicated shifts throughout the day. Um, who are, they're just they're just out there listening, right? Just for to respond clients, to respond uh, inside just Twitter. It's Facebook. It's okay. review sites. It's it's uh, Instagram. It's wherever a person, whatever channel a person wants to use to reach out to us or share mm -hmm. their opinion, we're gonna be we're gonna be there listening and we're gonna be there to offer help to them. And so that's an interesting point. You got six people spread out on different shifts. How much do you cover? Like eighteen hours a day? We cover we or, cover eight. I'm gonna test it out. Yeah, yeah, no, you should. Three forty-five this morning. <laughs> Um, Cause you've got nothing better going on, right? That's, yeah. Yeah. So, right. I'll be up. No, that'll be good. That's somebody, if it, somebody yeah. will get with you. Yeah. So, so we, we, we operate from 8 a.m. in the morning uh -huh. until midnight every day of the week. You cover 8 a.m. to midnight 8 on all to channels. Midnight. On all channels, there is always somebody there um, ready to respond take any kind of issue you have, feedback, whatever, and make sure it gets to the right person in the organization so they can resolve your issue for you, right? And then between- So just in a question of scale, yeah. six people, I mean, Quicken Loans is it's a pretty big company. That's a yeah, lot about 11, 12,000 people. How many people are out there uh, engaging with you on, of their, uh, that they're starting the conversation on social media? Uh, 
Well, I, I, I think it's important also, I mean, we don't just monitor and respond and, and, and route things for quick and loans. We actually mm -hmm. do it for family economy. Well, the whole family. Okay. Yeah, so for instance, you know, we, we you know. So you do Grand Circus. Uh, we, we do, if, mm -hmm. if there's something that we saw and you guys, you know, we thought you needed to see it, 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 it we'd send it around to you. Um, so we're really the first line, right? We're not gonna, for instance, we're not gonna go tweet back from Fathead um, because Fathead is the one that knows their business mm -hmm. um, better than anyone else. Uh, so what we do is we we send it to Fathead and we say, hey, here's here's somebody who you, you know you might want to reach out to them. Mm -hmm. um, now most of a lot of these companies have their own social media people there, but they haven't necessarily just because of whatever reason, size or maturity mm -hmm. of the organization, they haven't necessarily been able to build a a twenty four seven monitoring sure. center the way we have. So we help them out with that. You know, so you're like and an agency. We really almost are almost like an agency in the whole family. It's like a, what's the word, Zaibatsu? I like to say Zaibatsu. Zaibatsu. Or Kuretsu. Yeah. Kuretsu. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it really is. I don't yeah. know what that means. What is that? Is that like Zaibatsu is the early forming of Kuretsu. So Kuretsu in Japan is uh, like a company like Toyota. So they have several suppliers. They're all part mm -hmm. of a family. Family of companies. Oh. Think of it as a family of companies, yeah. not unlike the Gilbert family of companies. Yeah. But what Zaibatsu. a great answer in real time. I thought we I were going to have to we were going to go to Wikipedia and go to have to go to Wikipedia. That. But Zaibatsu wow. predated Kuretsu. Oh, that so was Zaibatsu was back from like 2000 years ago. But Kuretsu is the kind of new gotcha. version of Zaibatsu. Yeah, I mean we we very much uh, we, we operate our own agency, period, inside of Quicken Loans. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, you know, when we talked earlier about, you know, we're a technology company, we're a marketing company, mm -hmm. uh, we have a very, very strong bias toward um, building things ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and part of that is um, when, you know, when you build things yourself, uh, there's a real advantage, right, to somebody creating something for the company that, you know, you see their logo and name on your check every two weeks, right? Right. Um, and... And the other thing is, is that um, you know you have to be close to your business, and you have to understand the unique um, challenges of your business, and you have to be close to your clients. And we just feel like there are certain things you know that you don't want to outsource, and um, key systems and things that you depend on that give you a competitive advantage are are generally not things that you want to have other people build for you. Right. Um, and so, from a marketing perspective, I mean. You can talk about technology or you can talk about marketing expertise, and marketing expertise is a competitive advantage, right? And so do you want to own your competitive advantage or do you want to outsource your competitive advantage yeah. to an agency who maybe, you know, doesn't always have your best interest in mind because, you know, maybe mm -hmm. they have a competitor, you know, somewhere under the hood there as mm -hmm. well. Um, and, and they have to be buying. generic too. They can't really have a competitive advantage because they're trying to scale to uh, it's a, a great whole bunch of people. Yeah, it's a great point. I it's mean, like trying to buy a piece of software off the shelf. Well, you can't really have a piece of software off the shelf and then still have a software advantage. But by I, definition, you really can't. Absolutely. I mean, you've got to build this whole thing yourself. So that makes perfect yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. And I, and, and I think, you know, I mean, I, I think that it's served us very, very well. I, I mean, the, the, you know, it's served us very well over the years. Uh, it can present unique challenges that you just have to watch out for, primarily around um, uh, making sure that you don't become insulated, mm -hmm. right? Because one, one thing that's really great sometimes about working with an outside agency or an outside group or whatever is that they do bring fresh perspective in. So, um, so you know, it's really important to get out there. I, I think as we've grown and we've, we've grown more businesses and we've had like, you know, Detroit Venture Partners and mm -hmm. we've had, you know, DVP and we've had all these great businesses that have come up in downtown Detroit. Mm -hmm. We have a lot more... Um, cap a lot more ability now to be able to get out and, and talk to other people and, and get fresh perspective and knock ideas around. And I think that's only going to increase, right? Because that's, that's the whole idea behind having this creative uh, mass here in a, in a small concentrated area is that when you get all of these different kinds of businesses and thinkers and people and mm -hmm. cultures and everything, you know, and backgrounds together in one place, you have the ultimate lab for coming up with really, really creative solutions to everything from how do you close a mortgage better, how do you serve a client better, to how do you educate people better, like, you know, Grand Circus does, to mm -hmm. how do you, um, <clears throat> you know, how do you take a city that was written off, you know, by the majority of the world. Many times over. Many times over mm -hmm. with some really, really serious issues, not just in the downtown, but in the neighborhoods and in the macro economy here. And, how do you solve for those things, right? And it's you're, you're not gonna solve for those things with just a small group of people. You're gonna do it with 
a, a mixed group of people with a lot of different perspectives, all, however, aligned around the idea that there's something worth saving right. here and building, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't think it's any, any different in a, in, in a company like Quicken Loans. I mean, that's really what we try to do every day. So, uh, so that, 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 you know, in a nutshell, you know, that's a major, major piece for, for, for the social team is, is really being that front line for, for, the, for the client care side of things. And then there's a whole, uh, the, there's a whole other side of our, of our sort of in-house social agency that's all about creating content that's valuable to users, regardless of where they are in, in the client life cycle. Um, you know, um, social advertising is part of our team, blogging mm -hmm. is part of our team, um, you know, digital video production is part of our team, all mm -hmm. of those different things. So how do you wind up, you know, you've got this whole, let's just call this whole downtown now, this like massive creative campus, literally hundreds of companies down here now. Uh, a lot of them are part of the family of companies. Um, some of them are just sort of tangentially yeah. connected, but there's this, this whole thing going on down here and it's attracting uh, interesting people, it's attracting creative people, a lot of technology people, you know, and, and you're just saying, you know, we were just talking about how, you know, whatever was happening a year and a half ago in social, it's not even relevant anymore. Right. So how do you go about finding people for a, for a team like that? You know, I mean, if you've got six people literally monitoring social channels, but you must have a bigger uh, overall team of people who are creating content yeah. and who are who are integrating it into into all this stuff how do you find these kind of people and what do you look for to figure out okay what were you doing that is interesting to you now over the last year and a half because it's not like they can do the same thing it changes too fast yeah I, I mean we well one thing I'll tell you that we don't do is we generally don't hire people who come in with resumes with extensive social media experience interesting um, okay yeah and and Part of the reason for that is, um, I, so so my team in particular is probably seventy five percent millennial. So I would say that you know the majority of the people on my team are under twenty seven, mm -hmm. about twenty eight years old. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, well, yeah. You know, and uh, and so look, you know, they're they're users. They're users. They've grown up with social media for most of their you know formative years. Mm -hmm. um, they they they. You know, they've had smartphones. Um, the the next, the kind of the front edge of that is is you know going to be very different, right? Because they're not even going to be able to remember not having those things around. Yep. And so, really, you know, what we're looking for, right, is is you're always looking a for for attitude. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I have to, I can't stress that more, right? Like if you if you gave us two people, you gave me two people to choose from, and you yep. gave me a person from Harvard University with you know, a three eight or a four point and all the honors in the world and everything. Kind of the opposite of me. <laughs> the opposite of me as well. Mm -hmm. And you and, 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 and the person sort of was like, you know, they were they, they kinda like could go anywhere and they sort of, you know, whatever it is and you get and, and they had like great talent, right? But maybe they didn't have the drive or they didn't have the attitude. And you gave me somebody who might not even have a four year degree, but they've gone out and done something already. Maybe mm -hmm. they started a blog for themselves. Maybe they figured out a way to start a little business. Maybe they were, you know, maybe they had a blog and they were generating some some AdSense revenue off it. Uh, whatever it is, like I want to see that entrepreneurial kind of thing in there because mm -hmm. because that's that's what it comes down to now. Because if 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 you are assuming that things are changing very quickly, your four year degree um, doesn't right. really prepare you, right? Like that yeah. that's not what's valuable anymore. What's valuable is how fast can you identify opportunities and how quickly can you assess the situation and come back with creative solutions for, right. for how we might be able to try something. So we always try to start with attitude. I, was, I, I personally have very much like a soft spot for the underdog. It's, it's just something kind of that I've always had. And so um, in general, I've taken a lot of rolls of the dice on people. And I would say that, you know, probably nine times out of 10, it's paid off wonderfully. Like, like the, the chances that I take with people, once you get them through to make sure that they're, you know, they have the right, you know, attitude and stuff like that pay off because, um, you just never know where you're going to find it. And, and, and mm -hmm. I find that very, uh, in a way, very promising and it should give people a lot of optimism, especially those people out there who maybe are, you know, going through the thought process of, do I want to take on you know, sixty thousand dollars in college debt, mm -hmm. right? Do I want to really do that? Do I want to have that? And then I got to go out and find a job, and then I've got all these other things I have to deal with. I, I think some of that can be short circuited now. Yeah, um, I agree. You know, Completely. I don't know how you guys feel. Sounds about like that, James Altucher. I agree, and I, I think you know I have a son who's a freshman in college now, and I think as a parent, and I'm 
you know, it's so, there's so much pressure on you know, grades and all that stuff. And certainly grades are important and education is a great foundation. But sometimes it's like, it's great to hear that there's companies that are not preoccupied with the Harvard MBA types. Somebody who has shown that entrepreneurial spirit may not be a 4.0 student, may, hell, may be a, a 2.0 student, but has you know, some left and right brain going that can bring a lot to your culture. And I think that's maybe partly of what you're talking about is that culture of what is the cultural fit, not necessarily how does this person's resume look or how does this person look on paper. Yeah, and then the interesting thing is, right, you, you don't know what you don't know until you start to work with somebody. And so mm -hmm. um, there are many times that you may bring a person in for a particular role that you have open at that time, right? And it turns out they're not the right fit for it. And in the meantime, you find out they're a really great fit for this other role. Mm -hmm. And if you and if you only hired people, right, just for like the position that you have open, or if you only hired for sort of like, well, this person can do SEO and this person can do this and mm -hmm. can do that and everything, mm -hmm. you're kind of hiring for the wrong reason because what you really want is creativity, flexibility, adapt adaptability, attitude, uh, can work great with people, um, knows how to wow. get things done, right? How do you even right? figure that out though about a person? I mean, they all come in and say, I'm uh, creative and adaptive and flexible and stuff. I mean, that's, well, that's well, awesome. Well, I, I, that's yeah, really but, I don't, but I don't think you, you, but I don't think you, you I don't think you ask people. I right. say, are you that's flexible, like, how do you, right? How do you figure it out? Um, I mean, I, like, I, I, well, I mean, one thing that we, we've done a lot at, at Quicken Loans over, especially over the last couple of years that I think helps us with this, is we do massive internship programs. Oh, okay. Um, so... You know, this, this summer will bring uh, at least, uh, I think the number this year is at least a thousand interns. A thousand a interns. A thousand interns in a three month period. I've seen groups of them walking around here, no. in this building, next door. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. The groups of people that. Quicken Loans bags. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they'll go to Tigers games, like you know, Bruce, that sort of thing. Is right? Bruce one of the people who will, will walk through? So it's like a thousand well, person yeah. audition. Yeah, it, it really is, right? And, and we've, over the years, um, uh, you know, we've hired a lot of them. I mean, I, I, I can't say that like, you know, every intern will get a job at the end of it. And especially sometimes, sure. you know, they they may be like a, a freshman or a junior or whatever, and it may be a couple of years before they do it. But there's just, there's, there's nothing, you know, there's, there's nothing greater than being able to bring somebody in for three months and test drive them mm -hmm. out. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, you, you know, sometimes people can fool you, but I think with, um, you know, there's a, there's a really, um, I'm trying to think of his name now. It'll come to me. But there, there's a there's a, a book called Hiring for Attitude out there, mm -hmm. and I'll remember the name of the author. He he does a lot of like leadership stuff and things like that. And there are there are some some ways in an interview that you can you can kind of break through break through and start to understand like mm -hmm. but because e because even like the flexibility and adaptability sort of thing is something that you can kind of teach people a little bit. You just can't teach people attitude though, right? Mm -hmm. If a person's a victim or if a person it's going to be all about them and they're going to cut like. You, you can figure that out pretty quickly in an interview if you ask the right questions. I mean, all you have to really do is go out there and try to get that person to talk negatively about somebody or their former employer. If they go on and on and on, I mean, you'll sense it right away and you'll have to stop them because they will keep going and going and going and going and going and going. And, going. and you want to cut that interview off as fast as you can because right. that, that person eventually, you know, there's just nothing you'll be able to do for them until they can fix that. And it's arguable. It, arguably, can, you may yeah. never be able to, right? right. It's, it's, it's something, there's, there's a question, there's actually a question that I, I, I use in all interviews, and I've been using it for years now, and it's, um, and I frame it up a certain way, and it's, you know, I'll, I'll ask the candidate, usually um, it's one of the last questions that I'll ask, and I'll ask them something to the effect of, you know, everyone has something that they have to work on mm -hmm. um, in themselves, right? And it's probably something that you've worked on since you were, six, seven years old, and if I wanted to ask your parents, like, what's the one thing that, like, mm -hmm. Matt has always had to, like, you know, work on? And, like, your friends and your family will know it, right? And, um, and then I always tell the person, I say, and by the way, I want you to answer me really honestly about this, because this isn't a weeder question. I'm not trying to weed you out. What I'm trying to do is understand we all have these things. I have one or two or three or four of mm -hmm. them. And if you come in here, it's not going to change. You're still going to have it. Right. So tell us what it is. Self-awareness. Yeah, right. tell us what it is so we can help you when that thing comes up so that you can push through it, right? And, and it's amazing how honest people will be once you put that out there. And mm -hmm. um, actually, I'm, I'm, if somebody comes back and says, well, I work too hard, um, that's actually generally a time when I, like, I 
I don't want to bring that person back because right. I feel like I just opened up this great honest moment with them and they and gave they, me an they interview answer. They didn't right? adapt. And they, they, <laughs> and they googled what's the best answer. Yeah, yeah, answer. yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, most people don't know how to interview too, but you just basically set it up and you said, "Here, I'm going to tell you how to interview." Yeah, and, and what so do you do with it? Did you right? figure that part out yet? You know, yeah, because yeah. don't give me that standard response. I work too hard. And it's been and it's been great. Now, sometimes when people give me that answer, I'll I'll laugh at them, you know, and I'll say, "Okay, now." Okay, now give me the real answer. Like right. go, like go, go a level deeper on this. Like maybe there really is something mm -hmm. there. Like you know, well, I, uh, you know, I tend to, uh, you know, I, I, I tend to go really deep down into things. Okay, so like you know, you sometimes need somebody to pull you out of things. Is that like what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. So you got to kind of go mm -hmm. and explore that with a person as well. But because yeah, they uh, probably haven't done that before either, so it's a yeah. really good conversation starter because. You're really now you're just talking. You got you get you go past the rehearsal. That's the best kind of interview you can do. The other thing we do is we do team interviews, and so um, uh, typically, uh, you know, I may do an interview, maybe have another you know leader with me or another person from the team. Um, we'll kind of do that, and then if we if we like the person, we think it's somebody, and we do this with interns as well. So it's not just we actually interview interns like we're interviewing pretty much anybody else that would come into the team, which is why I think we have pretty good success mm -hmm. with hiring them on later and having great right. talent. Um, you do the group interview and um, it's, look, you can, it's sometimes, some people are very good at fooling one person. They can, right. um, you know, they can mirror back what they think that person wants. Mm -hmm. You drop that person in with 15 other people with different personalities who, by the way, like survivor. Yeah. Who, by the way, they've all been through that themselves. Right. And it, and it does one, it does two things for you. Um, and, and, and one is very beneficial to the candidate if they if they are hired the first thing it does is it, it it lets us check each other to make sure that you know this person isn't just really really good at um, at mirroring back at someone and the second thing it does is if you hire that person the first day they come into the team they already know all the faces right mm -hmm. they've already spent an hour to an hour and a half getting to know people in the team and I think your first day is so important in so many ways and sometimes just feeling like you're part of that team when you come in the first day and you're not completely mm -hmm. lost, especially in a company of 12,000 now, right? So um, I'm probably pretty good at onboarding these people. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Is that, well, we, that's, that's it's a huge like piece, the most yeah. important part of growing to 12,000 people. I mean, that's gotta be one of the, that's, what is that, like the third biggest in Detroit? Like yeah, that. I don't know exactly. It it's has big. to be, I mean, has to be up there. Yeah, company. I mean, I, yeah, you got the it, most it has to be thing. right. And 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 we, you know, we've. I mean, that's coming from five or six thousand. You know, probably in two thousand and nine or ten, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, it, it's we've had tremendous growth with that. You know, always comes challenges. But yeah, we do. I mean, we have a we have a a, a, a huge team of people that their job is literally onboarding people, and and that's. You know, not just, you know, coming in your first day and making sure that your computer's set up and that, you know, but touring you around and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and showing you where everything's at and bringing you into your team. And then you do things at team level. But then, you know, um, there's a follow up that goes on for several days where you get additional um, you get additional orientation and training on things. And then there's Dan and Bill Emerson, Dan Gilbert, and Bill Emerson, who every single new hire goes through a full day. Uh, with Dan, where he walks people page by page through the values of the company and, the isms. and the, through the isms. And I, I think that's a very, um, it's very remarkable to me and very much a testament, I think, to Dan's commitment to the power of culture mm -hmm. that um, a person who, you know, has a lot of businesses and he's a really busy guy, you know, makes I've time I've never seen to, uh, anybody that. that is as committed to culture as I, I, nobody in the planet. Yeah, I mean, I, I, haven't, I haven't worked at a Zappos, so I don't know mm -hmm. like what Tony Shea's like inside of there. You know, I mean, I think mm -hmm. Tony's pretty committed to culture. It always yeah, okay. has been, you know. Maybe. But, but, but I, I can tell you that, like, you know, I've never worked at a place. And I, I, I continue to be, I mean, even after 10 years, it, it's, it's astounding to me. And, and maybe it shouldn't be just because I know mm -hmm. the value we place on it. But I still think it's, it's very remarkable. And, um, and it, 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 it is the secret sauce. And, and we, we just, you know, we just spent... Uh, four days down in Cleveland two weeks ago, Dan has this thing called Family Reunion where he brings mm -hmm. all of the family of companies and senior leaders and everything together. I think we had 400 people or more down in Cleveland um, for, you know, like four days of all of us getting together and we have great speakers that come in. It's kind of like our own conference, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the theme this year really was creativity and culture and the importance of it. And we had, you know, we, we had... Um, uh, you know, the founder of Shinola was there to, to, to talk about, you know, you know what, what they're doing. Tom Cart, 
Cartosis. Cartosis. I can never. I, I'm going to get his name wrong. It's, it's a Greek name. We had him. We had the. Uh, we'll do a voiceover. So yeah. it's pronounced. Yeah. We had. Yeah. Thank you. We we it's had a girl voice. Yeah. Right. Time. Right. We had. There. You can do something fun with that. Like whatever. You know. <laughs> like I, I don't even. Think, I, I think everybody pronounces it wrong. Um, we. You know. We had. Uh, we had Ohio State. The Ohio State football. Uh, uh, teams coach in, you know, to talk. We had the Cleveland Cavaliers uh, mm -hmm. team in. Uh, we had um, uh, Sir Ken Robinson in, right? A great, great speaker. Um, and and the theme underneath all of these things were like, you know, really what makes great companies. And, and what makes a great company, um, it, it, you might call them different things, but the principles are essentially the same. If you look at a Zappos or if you look at a Quicken Loans or if you look at anybody that, that you know, has happy team members and mm -hmm. has happy customers, um, they're all doing a lot of the same things. Well, that's cool. So similar to, um, to you know, how you onboard people and identify, do you want to take, take a break? Okay. okay. Um, we'll edit that part out. Just kidding. Um, so similar to how you guys are, how you evaluate you know, people to work for your company and bring them into your culture. How do you guys, how does Quicken Loans evaluate, you know, you guys are a very progressive company, you guys have, you are working, you know, kind of in social media, it's a very rapidly evolving landscape. How do you guys evaluate startups, right? So there's, you know, you guys, you probably get tons of emails from startups, say I've got this great new thing. How do you guys evaluate those? And, you know, because you don't, certainly you don't want to miss out. Like I think before show you were talking about Twitter and. You were talking to Twitter before that Twitter was really a big thing, and so how do you how do you evaluate all those the startups? I mean, how, so that you make sure that you're not missing out. Yeah, I mean, I don't want I don't want to speak for you know like Bizdom or DVP or you know any of the companies that you know actually go out and and you know do this you know for a living. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I mean, I can you know I would say that you know there's a few things you look at right. Like one thing you know going back to culture again is you're looking at like. Who's the founder of the company? Like, mm -hmm. who's the jockey, right? Like, there's a mm -hmm. saying that, like, sometimes the horse is less important than the jockey that's on the horse. And so, um, you know, there are, and in fact, that was one of the things that stood out. We, had, we, have, we have some new businesses that have, have joined the family when I was at, at Family Reunion, and um, they have some amazing jockeys, you know, these, like, mm -hmm. super energetic, younger, you know, men and women who are just so passionate about their business that you just know that, like, if what they created right now isn't quite what it needs to be, they will figure it out, right? With, with, with some help and some support and some coaching, they will, um, what's, the, what's the word that this, uh, you know, they like to use, pivot, right? Mm -hmm. Pivot, right? Um, they, they'll figure it out, right? And, 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 and I think it's a, 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 like very rarely is your first idea and is your first go at the business mm -hmm. the thing that ends up being the thing that you wind up driving forward with. I'm on 24. A, yeah, I mean, and it might take you 25 before you, thinking, or maybe 30. I was you know? thinking it was 26. <laughs> Whatever the number is, mm -hmm. right? Right. So, um, so you're always interested in, you know, in who the people are, right? Like, are they? Because the thing is, is like maybe, maybe the business idea that they have isn't the right business idea, and you kind of discover that after you put a little investment in it. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, is okay, how, how are they going to be able to retool this thing so that they can make it something that works? And that comes down to the people, not necessarily the mm -hmm. idea, right? So I, I would say so that. startup founders and interns are pretty much the same. So I, yeah, well, they've, it's a great analogy. Yeah, no, I think they probably are, right? And, um, and, and then, you know, you, you want to look at, you know, does it, does it bring value to someone, right? Is it something that you don't necessarily want to say, would I use it? Because you're an audience of one, right? Or focus mm -hmm. group of one. So that's usually not a good way to do it. But does it make sense, right? And is it something where, you know, where, where, where you think it would bring value to people? Uh, and, um, or is it just so crazy that it's crazy original and it probably deserves a little more time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we... And that's part of the culture. Yeah, absolutely. As well. Yeah, yeah, and and you know it's crazy's it, okay. Crazy's okay. I, I, crazy is good. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of times. I mean, you have to you have to temper it, right? But you have to create spaces for crazy, and you have to create spaces for people to um, to to feel comfortable coming up with really crazy off the wall ideas, and um, and it has to permeate things. That's so. a great line. It's create spaces, spaces for crazy. So I mean, that right there is a reason why uh, people would want to come work. In the, I think in so. The quick and fam, quick and loans family of companies, just because I mean, especially when you're talking about you know you got all these millennials working for you, that's like a huge core part of what they want. They want to have they want to go into a space where they they have a, a space to create crazy. And yeah, and 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 you know, 
I gotta tell you, you know, there's a lot of talk about millennials, and there's a lot of there, there, there's a lot of stereotypes. Like whenever you start talking about generational, mm. you know, mm-hmm. generational dynamics, you're always gonna get into to stereotypes, right? right. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm a Gen Xer, and so we're I was slackers, like, right? yeah, we're I'm, supposed to be slackers, slacker. yeah, right. You know, and baby boomers. I mean, they have their own set of things. Don't get and, me started on baby boomers. <laughs> and and I, I got to tell you, like I, you know, I, I've said this to my team a number of times. I, 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 like I don't know where this comes from. Like I don't get. You know, we've heard things about people being entitled and everybody wants their blue ribbon. And yeah, I mm. think the values are a little different sometimes, but like I don't think that they're bad and and only have positive stereotypes of millennials yeah that's good yeah i well there's totally super entrepreneurial yeah independent they're they're the kind of you know i mean the description of what you said the the company values fits completely in with what i would say are the positive stereotypes of millennials they are cut out to operate in the today's economy yeah i mean they're 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 fast fast. they're taking inputs in from all over the place It's yeah, they don't struggle with it. Um, you know, it's it, it's it, it, their pace is different. Um, there's definitely like a social. Um, mm-hmm. I see a lot of social responsibility. You know, I have like I've had people come to the team where like one of the first questions is is how much volunteer work can I do? Right, right. Like that's that never was or very rarely was that ever something that mm-hmm. you ever had somebody putting high on their on their list of reasons to go work for a company. And we just happened to have a great program with, mm-hmm. you know, I think we put 40, 40 to 60,000 hours into the community last year. So we have that apparatus. We've built a great, you know, thing for that. So we can offer that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, do, do, you know, flexible. I mean, the thing that remains to be seen, and this is, and this is, you know, going to take a few years before we can come to conclusions. Is we've heard that this is a pretty mobile group from the perspective of that they're not going to stay at companies for a long for a long time. Mm-hmm. And um, I, and we just don't know yet, right? Is it is it that they're not going to stay at companies for a long time for the same reasons that I didn't stay at companies right, exactly. for a long time because I got mm-hmm. bored, I didn't feel challenged, whatever it is. Yep. And so if we're feeding people the right things yep. and focusing and investing in the right things, um, maybe they do stay for 10 years. Yeah, maybe I mean, they'll join an ecosystem. Uh, right, right, right. But they won't necessarily join something where it's like, they're, this is, you know. That, that, that's interesting, right? I mean, is it is it more about having the values around things, mm-hmm. right, and building the values? Is that really... What's important? Because I, because I, 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 I do think one thing is, is like nobody wants to feel like they work for the man or for the right. company, right? right? Like, like some some people, are, I guess, are okay with that, but I think this generation mm-hmm. is probably less. And, and part of that, expect that anymore. Well, because their parents, their parents, right? Yeah. They watched uh, many of them mm-hmm. watched their parents go an through, yeah, lose mm-hmm. an entire career after potentially decades and decades of time mm-hmm. at a a auto, you know, company or whatever it may be, right? And mm-hmm. so. They, you know, they're 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 concerned about that. Do I right. want to make that kind of investment? So um, and it's like future shock too. You know, like El, the Elvin Toffler book. You know, the fa- the rate the rate of change is faster than 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 a lot of people could adapt before. They're they're perfectly capable of adapting as fast as the rate of change goes on. So as companies do that, that's yeah. really kind of in line with how they already function. You know, they're not going to sit there and try to do the same job for thirty years. Yeah, it's it uh, it's an excellent it's, point. It's, it's, I mean, and. Look, I don't want. I didn't want to do the same job for thirty years. I mean, right. I, like in, in many ways, like I share that, right? And, right. and um, I've just been, you know, very fortunate to be able to do a lot of different things, and um, that's very rewarding. It's always kept, you know, kept kept me very. Maybe you're really so. just a millennial. Maybe that was ahead of his heart, time yeah. as a Gen Xer. Yeah. Secret face off, right? right. All of a sudden, it's not millennial. Yeah. So on, on similarly, so when you're evaluating marketing partners, right? So like, as a, how do you startups in the kind of the as a marketing partner, right? So you probably get emails all, hey Matt, I'd like the meeting. I've got this great widget that I think is going to help yeah. Quicken Loans do this, this, and this. How do you think about that, right? Or as a as a company, as a team, as an individual, how do you evaluate and what is important uh, to you? Uh, for startups, right? Because, you know, Mike and I talk to startups. We're kind of in the startup community here. So maybe for, you know, the startups who are in our audience, that would be great feedback to, you know, here's how quick, and again, it's not like one thing, but, you know, what are some of the things that you, the quick and Loans thinks about as mar- for marketing partners? Yeah, right? it's, a, yeah it's, a, it's a great question. I, I'll, I'll kind of take a step back and sort of like take it away maybe from quick and Loans to begin with. Okay. I think the first thing is, is if you're, if, if you're trying to get in with a business, you have a new product, you have a new service, whatever it is, you're a startup. I mean, this applies to even if you're a mm-hmm. semi-mature company, 
don't send a form email. Um, I got to tell you, I get more of that now than I ever have. And part of the, and, and really? once, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I, I would say that I get 12 to 15 unsolicited emails from various companies trying to sell me something a day. Sometimes I'll get, I'll get 10 from the same person over a period of two weeks. I think part of it is all of this marketing automation oh, stuff that's put, yeah. been put in place where salespeople and account people now can like put these people into the CRM system and right. it fires off these form emails. Yeah. And if you happen to you know oh. make the mistake and be curious and click on the link, it's got trackers on there. And now it fires off something that tells that person they opened your email up and they clicked on something. And so let's now send them more. let's send them more, right? And, uh, and, and, and I, I'll tell you like one of the biggest challenges is that like that first of all like the emails don't tell me anything about what these companies do and second they don't they, 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 mm -hmm. there, there's no understanding of my business like mm -hmm. if you if you come and tell me you know I'm going to help you increase your marketing efficiency well uh, that's making a lot of assumptions about yeah. my marketing efficiency and it's mm -hmm. not an arrogance thing on my part I mean we, uh, we always mm -hmm. could get better at it but like you're not really in a position to be able to make any promises to us about anything that so you're going to be able to do. increasing market efficiency is just bullshit bingo. It right? totally it's, is. I yeah. Mean, I mean, increasing market of course you're efficiency. Gonna, you why know, would I even talk to you if you weren't going to do that? Cutting edge, you know, marketing automation products. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, we, we could have fun with it, right? We could pull these things up and see them. I could probably pull some up for you and read them. Right. Later, you know, but um, you, you just don't know anything about our business. So, mm -hmm. like, you're not really in a position to be able to do it. So, um, and then the other thing is, is like, you know, don't say, hey, can I just get 30 minutes of your time? Because 30 minutes no. of a person's time before you really understand what it is. And, and by the way, I don't have any idea what your business does. Why do you need 30 minutes? I, I, it, it's the magic people number. People actually it's call 30 you and minutes. say, can I have 30 minutes get of email. your time? Okay. Can, can, we, can I just grab 30 minutes of your time later today? Um, I've had, <laughs> there's another tactic wow. that's great. I don't know if anyone else has ever yeah, experienced this. No, but I've gotten the, someone scheduled, an, I've had this happen three times now. Someone schedules an appointment with me. So it, suddenly I'm looking at my calendar and there's like yeah. a, there's a, a phone call, a teleconference scheduled with someone. And I'm like, who, who is this, right? And it's some vendor who uh -huh. used Outlook to basically try to schedule something in my Outlook to fool me into doing a phone call with them. So I think the recession. They, just, they, they know your email, so they send <laughs> yeah. you an invite. Immediately. They send me an invite, and what happens is I just accept a lot of my invites because right. generally if somebody invites me to something, there's a reason right. I should be there, right? Uh, Becca, could you help? Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. And uh, and so those, those are some things. So I, what I'm saying is, is like take the time to learn something about the business before you go out and pitch it, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, you never, as, a, as, a, as an account person or as an entrepreneur, you have never had more information about companies at your fingertips, right, than you have ever mm -hmm. had today at this moment in history. I mean, you can, yeah, you can get on LinkedIn and look at my profile and say, hey, he's a guy I need to send the email to. That's great, <clears throat> but don't, but don't just stop there, right? Like go out and read the articles about the company and try to find somebody that works at the company. And, or if you're gonna call the person, have a conversation and say like, what are the biggest challenges that you're having right now as a business, you know? And get that feedback and then craft your pitch off from that, right? And then come back with your solution because, um, you know, and you can be creative with an email. I'm not saying you should never send an email to someone, but if you're gonna mm -hmm. send an email to someone, make sure that it's, it. it's personalized. And that doesn't mean just changing the two on, on it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I got one. I got one the other day where the person addressed it to themselves. So it said, it didn't say "Dear Matt." It mm -hmm. said "Dear" the name of the person who was sending it to me. So it's, it's it's a dear <laughs> first name, last Sales name. First, they had some <laughs> algorithm that just basically is like a giant email. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know that I, I just I think you know if you're if you're if you're coming in, you know, take the time to understand who 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 you're working with and, and what you they read your email. Doing. Yeah, I remain. Email. Really? Yeah, I do. So people that actually would put the time in to actually send you a reasonable, uh, you know, pitch yeah. uh, email that would be yeah, that, but that I have a, an effective way to do it. <coughs> yeah, but I have a but I have a but the 1997 style space. Well, you got to remember, is, right? I'm so I'm pulling up for you know I'm mm -hmm. pulling up my phone right now. You got to remember that like when you go into like so I use that thing called Good, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but when you go in there right, it gives you um, like the first couple of sentences of the email. You can see right, so you can okay. see the subject line, the first couple of sentences. You also have to remember like if you're doing it on your desktop, a lot of us use Preview Pane, right? Mm -hmm. So you you see the first couple of sentences, you see Preview. <clears throat> you get really good at filtering out form emails from people, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you I see them. 
but I look for, there's you just learn after a while like look for the buzzword bingo that's in mm -hmm. them and if you can't figure out in the first sentence or two what the people do like you you you're just gonna you're just gonna put them in the trash can right, right. um so i you know i, I so think maybe somebody that said here's five ideas that you should consider i would you would probably that. read that yeah but dear sir dear marketing professional <laughs> if dear, I, dear matthew cardwell probably not a yeah good. not a good one or <laughs> You know, if you, you know, paid search is a great channel that you should be in. Mm. Would you like to, you know, have mm. us help you increase your search rankings on page one of Google? Fast and overnight, guaranteed. Uh, <laughs> I see that your title has social in it. Do you know that social marketing is good? I have gotten emails like that. I could, I could probably pull some up right now. So anyway, be relevant. Understand the business mm -hmm. you're going after. Um, it, yes, it's a game of fishing, but you know what? It's probably more effective for you if you spent your time focusing on two or three really great candidates, building the relationship with them, taking the time to learn about them, getting creative about how you get in. I'll tell you, I got something from my, and I, and I can't think of the name of the company now, but I just got this. They sent me a, um, a beef brisket. So this, this uh, is a genuine. Yes. <coughs> so a piece of brisket, meat. Not a yeah. And, and this isn't mm -hmm. just any beef brisket. This beef brisket is from Salt Lake in Austin, Texas, which is one of the best barbecue places in the country and definitely like probably the now, best. Are you like a big, big beef brisket aficionado? No, they had no idea had about no this. Idea. No, but, but here's, here's what they did. And this is pretty brilliant, right? And, and, and even a small company could do something like this. Um, because these kinds of things you don't have to do at scale, right? So mm -hmm. what they did was they sent me this. They sent me like a FedEx overnight envelope, right? That went right to my desk. Someone took it to me, <clears throat> and I'm like, "What is this?" You know, it's like FedEx. It's like an overnight mm -hmm. thing. And so I open it up, and inside there's like this nice little kind of cool folder, and I and it said something about br brisket. I kept this thing. I wish I brought it with me. You open it up, and there's like some some wet naps inside of it, and all of this, and it said, "Hey, you know." Um, you know, they, they, they gave a pitch for their company and they said, oh, by the way, um, keep an eye out for your brisket and, you know, we'll have a great chat over barbecue or something like that. Give us a call and they had the information. And then about oh, a week later, I got a call from the mail room. There's a perishable item down here. <laughs> I go downstairs. I come back with this cooler. No. There is a four pound beef brisket four pounds i, I mean that's a big brisket that's, right that's gonna last you all winter long yeah and um and and so i got an appointment with this guy next week to talk to him right because he caught my attention and um and he gave me a brisket and like i feel like i at least owe the guy a conversation and by the way i had the brisket and it was amazing right. i highly recommend this Did place right guys are, no no it's all done oh so it's you all just gotta... yeah it's in a, it's vacuum packed right in this like thing and you and and you just it's it's like frozen but i think when i got it, it had already thought out but it was still cold it was all cool and yeah. everything you just unwrap it you put it in your oven your whole house smells like a a a, a like a Texas smokehouse. Did it have like the barbecue sauce in it already? It, like, it was already coated with some of it, but they gave you a bottle of their homemade. Yeah. It's really, it was, it was excellent. And uh, and it's got to be an interesting meeting, though. You know, it's like we need ideas. We got to get through these crazy people. ideas. I got it. It's brisket. brisket. Four pounds. We're gonna send Four brisket pounds. to everybody. Yeah. Well, and they somebody did, actually had to throw right. that out there. And by the way, I mean, think about it from an ROI perspective. This is how they looked at it. Like I, I like I'm actually mm -hmm. a, a big fan of these kinds of. Right. marketing things for a company that wants to be scrappy and try to get in and get because right getting right. the phone call is always the hardest part um but if you think about it like if they came and did business with a company like quicken loans and they were a great company and they could bring value to us i mean we could potentially spend hundreds of thousands of dollars with them and probably mm -hmm. the brisket and everything they did was under a hundred dollars right or maybe mm -hmm. it was like that or whatever yeah, yeah but but i doubt that they sent out hundreds of these they probably picked 25 companies that they really mm -hmm. wanted to do business with of a certain size just to get the the, the conversation yeah started. and 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 you know over the years I, I used to do business early in my career i was doing more business to business marketing and software technology mm -hmm. and we used to do some of these things right where that we call them dimensional mailers and mm -hmm. and because you because the whole thing is getting someone's attention getting through the gatekeeper um and things like that and i've seen them done really poorly and this was one of the best ones mm -hmm. i've ever seen right like because if it was spoiled that would have been that would have been bad that would have been they would have probably should have worked on yeah that. but, but the think cooler was a good but one. think about it i'm sitting there like eating this yeah. brisket being thankful well, here we to are this talking company. about it right. now, obviously yeah especially if their product or their service is getting through the gatekeeper yeah 
then you really want to listen to them. I, I thought it was great. So, so I, so I got an, I'll, t- I'll let you know how it goes and, uh, you know, maybe we'll do something with these guys. Maybe we won't, but right. still, I, I, but, but, but if you think about it, if you're a small company, you could go do something like that. If you mm-hmm. like, keep your list small, figure out the people you want and then do what you have to do and be creative to get in with them and have fun with it. Right. And be a little crazy. Don't just do what everybody else is doing and send them, you know, constant emails begging for their business. Yeah. yeah. It just it's, doesn't work anymore. It's just right? lazy. Yeah. It's like, yeah. come up with one sentence. One. Well, it's, it's, it's spray and pray, right? The idea is like, uh, you know, if I send out, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know 10,000 of these things, I'll get like one, right? But like... But who's going to respond to that? Though? I don't know. What kind of customer are you going to get that's just like, that, there, that's them right there. This is the best spam I've had all week. You know you could send spam because it's cheaper than brisket. But <laughs> you could send somebody yeah. a can of spam. But I, but, but you, you could. This idea. Okay. This Maybe this idea sucks. To tuna <laughs> but it's spam. It's spam. I get it. It's uh, it's ironic, See, right? Here's here's yeah, it's, 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 it's yeah. I think it's ironic. Never figure yeah. out what ironic really means. And I was yeah. let's really really nothing. I don't know what ironic yeah. is. I don't even understand the song. Well, the song is not ironic. That's what I thought. Although, although it's ironic, it's ironic? not ironic. And, and maybe, maybe that's that why it's like, ironic. Yeah. I think that might have been. It's like the Matrix. I don't really understand. Yeah, yeah. So, so I don't know. The spam might work. I'll tell you though that I think the sensation, and I have you know, I have nothing against a good you know fried spam sandwich. You know, every now and then, and uh, you know that sort of thing. I don't thing, think I've ever tasted. Spam. Never had. Oh, I have no idea. Oh, it's, it's a it. wonderful food. You're you know, it's really? the, it is it is it is the uh, like. Uh, here's a trivia question for you. Okay. Who consumes, what state consumes more spam than any other state in the Arkansas. Union? Arkansas. Nope. West Virginia. My nope. Vote. Dang it. Nope. Man. Michigan. No. California? Per capita or volume? Ah, th- ah, <laughs> don't go there, but probably, I don't know. Probably Kansas both, City. That's not even a state. California is closer. Nevada. Nevada. Nope. Uh, Hawaii. Oh, I can see that. Spam is a spam is a so, so my wife is Hawaiian and spam is like a major food group in Hawaii. Really? Part of it part of it has to do with the, during the war it was very hard to get beef canned there. Meat, right? So yeah. it was canned meat, right? right. But but By they the time but, you sent your brisket to Yeah, yeah, well, yeah that's a whole other thing. Was, they blew it up. Right, exactly. Oh, yeah. 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 So so spam is very big in Hawaii mm. and uh, and they put it like in their fried rice and they eat it they they put it in with noodles and everything else. So we always have like a can of spam around the house. Boy in there, right? Yeah. But it's not the same experience as having the brisket, right? Like right. I'm like like I'm not feeling as much love for the vendor that sent me this the, the can of spam, right? Well, I'm conceiving it as a brisket, so. Got it. So how does people how do how do these people that we've just described so accurately go about becoming a uh, an intern? Is there like a Yeah, so 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 um we're you know right now we're we're still hiring interns for the summer mm-hmm. uh so if if people are interested uh the best thing to do is go, to go to quickenloanscareers.com mm-hmm. uh and go ahead and uh put your application in if you have a resume that helps um i don't know that you have to have one but you probably should uh and just fill the application out there will oftentimes there will be positions intern positions uh listed so you may be able to go in and actually say hey i'm interested in a marketing intern position mm-hmm. um other times you just say, "Hey, I want to be an intern," and then during the screening process, when when the um, when the the recruiting team follows up with you, you can talk about where your interests are, and then they can kind of see what's available. Uh, we do run these year round, by the way. So even though the summer is the really really big group that we bring in, and uh, you know one of the really great things about doing the summer program is that there's a lot of activities that are mm, you know yeah. planned around it um, a lot of them around Detroit exposing you to different things i think we do the the tour detroit bus tour i think all the interns get to go on that where you get to go around and see all the cool places that you never knew about mm-hmm. in detroit right um at, heidelberg, at heidelberg and all that mm-hmm. stuff yeah no, yeah it's, it's a detroit it's, it's detroit Pittsburgh. The Detroit Experience Project, which was Dehive, they're the ones yeah. that put that out. Which, by the way, is an amazing, they're cool, amazing tour to do. Um, and uh, and you know, if you if if you haven't done that and you live here in Detroit, it's awesome. Um, so so that's really what it comes down to. And um, if you're interested that's in a marketing, team, team, marketing, it's marketing, technology, technology operations, banking, HR, legal. Uh, you it's name it. I mean, we yeah yeah. I mean, every I don't think there's a team in Quicken Loans that doesn't. Um, that doesn't take interns on, including Dan's team. So um, there's, there's, you know, there's great opportunities. And if you're interested in a particular area, 
um, you know, make sure you let your recruiter know that. Mm -hmm. I would say if you can't necessarily get a, a position in the area you're looking for, I would not take that as a reason not to do an internship here because I think, um, uh, I think you can have a great experience and learn a lot just being inside of the company. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, I, we, we just had somebody come over um, and transferred off from an internship into the social team on the blog side of things, and he was an intern down on the legal team hmm. and originally. And he's a great writer, and we're like, okay. And so he just offered to do some writing for us while he was interning with the legal team. We're like, this guy's a great writer. And we talked to the legal team. They're like, yeah, he should come up and work for you guys, you know? So he just moved up and he's doing blogging now and cool. we're excited about it, right? So, um, you know, get, get, in, get into the company. And if you're a recent graduate, uh, it's a great way for you to potentially get your foot in the door if you're looking for, you know, for full-time employment somewhere. Again, you can't always make guarantees, but um, I can tell you that the experience, and especially if when you come in and you take the time to sit down with your leader, uh, or your mentor and say, look, here are the things that I really want to try to do. I want to you know, build my resume up. I want to mm -hmm. have a project that I can put down that has some numbers on it. Um, because that's the biggest challenge you have when you graduate from college. Right. The types of jobs that you probably had when you're in college aren't necessarily going to have ROI on top of them, right? right? Like you probably are working in like service or retail or something like that. And um, you know, while those, those are critically important you know, roles, um, you probably didn't, you know, like increase revenues 10% for Applebee's, right, yourself. Right, right. Um, but we, but you could conceivably inside of Quicken Loans, and many interns have worked on projects where you were able to have a measurable impact on the business that you can now put on a resume that that's really what gets you hired at the end of the day these days, right? So Matt, tell us a little bit about, um, with respect to social and marketing, what are some of the, the challenges that, that Quicken's facing in the marketplace today, what are some of your challenges, would you say, from a marketing perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think we, look, I think the, the marketing team at Quicken Loans actually is, has one of the hardest, hardest marketing jobs there, there is, um, because they're working um, with a product that is intangible, it's a financial instrument, right? It's a mortgage. It's not mm -hmm. something you can touch and feel, and it's infrequent. The average person is is going to do a transaction with us, you know, maybe every four to six years, right? You you purchase a home, and then maybe you know you you refinance it a couple of years later. Some people, if their value is going up a lot, will be able to refinance more frequently than that. But rates have been very very low, right? So if you're getting into a three or four percent, you know, mortgage right now, you you know you may not refinance for many years unless you're going to do cash out or something, and so I think, you know, we feel it, um, we, we feel some of the, the, the pressures of having this intangible, infrequent product more acutely in the social media team because so much of social is fueled by the visual, right? And, um, you know, I saw a statistic recently now that, that, that photos have outstripped all other forms of content that are uploaded to the internet, including video, right? And, um, you know, that's because, um, you know, because of this thing I'm holding in my hand, you know, called, you know, the mobile smartphone, and right? Soon and, and soon the watch, right? And all these different and wearables and things like that, right? And, um, and so, <clears throat> you know, what's happened is, is that it's easier than ever, right, to document visually what's going on in your life. And certain products um, are just more prone to being shared and photographed. It, it's, mm -hmm. I, I'm a big fan of Instagram, by the way. I've been using it since, almost since Instagram came out. And I've always been fascinated by the spontaneity of how people will share mm -hmm. photos of products, right? Like, you talk about people like being kind of like, you know, against consumerism and you know and, and not about companies but like they'll take pictures of their favorite shampoo at the CVS right, yeah, right like right. this is my favorite shampoo right yeah. or Shinola for example yeah. speaking of watches like I yeah. have an Instagram fan too and it's like people like that's Shinola's whole campaign of people just taking pictures of this yeah right? yeah and, and right so what it is is it's a beautiful aesthetic right it's right. a beautiful product and 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 it's it's tangible and somebody gets excited when they have it and stuff now I mean we happen to believe that like the great thing about a mortgage is it allows you to be able to buy a new home so I think there's moments in there as well but those are those are not um, like you kind of got one shot at that for several years right and then you do a refinance and what are you gonna do take a picture of your closing package right we have right. a pretty cool closing package by the way people are pretty all awesome unboxing. check out this title 
Well, you know what? They do have a good yeah. Yeah, it's we have it all. Yeah, it's yeah. it's amazing. You know, it's it's, it's it's like no no other. We put a lot of time into it, mm-hmm. and it, it really is different, right? But it's still it's still not like uh, you know John Varvato's just opened up down here, and there's like people standing out in the corner right now taking pictures of his, his storefront, right? So um, there are just certain products that are naturally um, you know generate that and get you all of that earned media, and it's and it's not as easy for us, right? So so I think. Um, that's something that you know we're always working on and we're mm-hmm. always trying to figure out and um, we kind of take it as a badge of honor that we don't have an easy product right that it's a little harder to um, to get people to sort of you know do those things they naturally do in social media um, with our brand but you know when we have our wins we did a billion dollar bracket back in the in the spring of last year which was you know a, a, mm-hmm. an amazing project to work on it's pulled together very quickly and was really really cool and it, and it gave us you know NASCAR um, we do a NASCAR sponsorship. That's actually one of our most active, most engaged social communities is around racing. And if you think about it, it makes sense. There's a race every weekend. Quicken Loans is on the car. They're very loyal to the brands that help the teams get their drivers out of the track every week. And we have amazing reach, you know, um, with that. So, uh, you know, I think that's part of it. I think from a, a social perspective, every brand, I don't even think from a social perspective, from a marketing perspective, we're in an increasingly noisy world with and it's becoming harder and harder and harder to be unexpected and stand out Mm -hmm. um and i think you know you you would go back 10 years and say the same thing but i would say that it's even more that way now because there's so many more inputs coming in there's so many more channels there's so much more stimulation there's so many more messages out there and so how do you stand out how do you get noticed without being gimmicky right because yeah, you know, you can, you can do it. It's happening a lot. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, and, and some brands that works very well for right. Like your Taco Bell, like you know, you, you mm-hmm. know who your audience is. Like <laughs> you know, you gotta just take some chances too. Right? Yeah, you do. It's and some and, of it's serendipitous, probably like and, Oreo or something. You know, like yeah. This. Their, their Twitter campaign. It, it is. And, and you know what's interesting yeah, now is they – actually, it's not as serendipitous as you think it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, what – I mean, they have highly – planned out groups of people who are sitting there in their command centers around major like yes like this with their hands yeah. over the keyboard yeah. they in fact Waiting will the they'll do off. scenario planning ahead of it saying yeah. what are all the different scenarios that could happen right so um it it, it it yeah sometimes it just happens a lot of times it doesn't just happen a lot of times it actually is, is sometimes much people more from out. nabisco go and pull the plug out <laughs> you know who knows i don't know right you know um and, and, you know, the other thing, too, is, like, look, there's a lot of money that's gone into it, too. It's that that stuff doesn't just, uh, you know, uh, that stuff doesn't just happen. Um, you know, those tweets get mm-hmm. promoted, and promoted tweets are paid for. And sometimes, you know, there are, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars thrown at some of those things to get them rolling. And, and, and so, um, you know, I, 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 would, I would caution, you know, companies to be, you know, to be careful about chasing after the 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 um the, the holy shot. grail of viral right because mm-hmm. because it, 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 and and i actually happen to think that smaller companies and entrepreneurs and stuff are actually the ones that are probably positioned best to be able to do something that is very word of mouth oriented but um the chances of you being able to do it without throwing some additional like amplification money in and stuff are pretty slow pretty low but i think that's just an issue that all marketers are dealing with um I think also we you know we're trying to figure out what's going on with with the television with broadcast because that landscape has changed dramatically. I would argue even just in the last like five years. But you know mm. you look at all of the data out there and you look at what's happening and we know it ourselves. Depending on you know how you view and consume media, we talk about millennials and they're consuming media very differently. Um, the 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 you know you used to be able to go out and you know put put an advertisement on the Cosby Show and. And, and reach a huge segment with one commercial, a huge portion of the United States. I won't mm-hmm. quote the number because they'll get it wrong, but it, it was massive, it was right? And now, you know, even if you go into like one of the top rated programs like, uh, you know, The Voice or Dancing it's with the fraction. Stars or something, it's, it's a, a fraction, fraction right? Mm-hmm. And part of that is because, you know, cable television has, has, you know, broke all of this out. But a lot of it is that people are pulling the plug, right? And a mm-hmm. lot of people are now consuming media in different ways. Now, I think... I happen to think it, it, it presents some really exciting opportunities for marketers because, and we, we talked a little bit about this, you know, when we kind of did our call before we did the show. I mean, the, the, the kind of targeting that has just become the norm in 
digital media of being able to like really target down on a person's interests and get the right kind of content or advertising in front of them for what you know th will be most appropriate for them, I believe will happen with television as well. Um, I think what we're waiting for right now is who is going to be the iPhone of the television. Um, because it still isn't there yet. Uh, yeah, you know, you, you, there's the DVRs, maybe it'll be the iPhone. I mean, you know, Apple tried to do, you know, Apple TV. I don't think it quite got there. Google's tried, tried to mm -hmm. take a whack at it, right? But but the, when you think about it, these are fundamental revolutions in the interface, right? Mm -hmm. And the interface of browsing the internet and using things, so I was talking, I don't have an Xbox, but someone was telling me the Xbox has some, some pretty awesome stuff in it. But the problem is the Xbox is still a gaming machine to most people, right? Mm -hmm. And so until you can come out with that product that allows people to, to really start to utilize uh, the television as the hub and they can use it, it um, it's going to be challenging. But once it comes, it will not be long before advertisements are going directly to you, right? You're, you're, you're not going to see... I think Microsoft views the Xbox as just the big screen in the living room. Right. That, that's kind of, I think... To that's them, the, it's like, yeah. put Netflix on it, put Hulu on yeah. it, and it's gaming, but it's a whole huge portion of the population that you know that's their primary form of uh, entertainment yeah. is through that box right but the but the browsing experiences are still not great right Clunky, and right. things like that you know yeah. so i mean it'll happen and you know from a trend perspective we're always looking at like like it's it, it's mm -hmm. almost always been about interface uh revolutions really right. it's about how yeah. how people interact with things and so if you think about it the the personal computer and the television are, are ripe for that um and you know, pe people think I'm crazy when I say this, but it's not going to be that far off where I don't think you're, I think you're going to be able to basically have some type of apparatus, whether it's something you're wearing over your ear or whether it's a Google glasses kind of thing or whatever it is. Some Oculus Rift. Uh, Oculus Rift. I don't know what it is. Hopefully it'll be cooler looking than like you won't have to wear these like, you know, goggles over well, your face. Nobody will be right? able to tell that everybody <coughs> looks stupid. Right, exactly. We'll all, we'll all look great. But you're right. I think it is the interface, right? It could be the windscreen, you know, like with the automated vehicles. Mm -hmm. We've talked about automated vehicles mm -hmm. on our show before. But Minority you know, report. Why couldn't the, your whole windscreen be a, a screen, right? Once you press, I want to go to grandma's house a couple states mm -hmm. away, press the button, and then your windscreen yeah. all of a sudden is, is an interface. Yeah. You're watching TV or whatever the heck you're doing. You yeah. don't have to worry about it. Well, and, and, the, and the interface is going to be uh, like, it's right. The, the last frontier, right, is moving from touch, right? So, so that's what Apple did with their phone, right? Like you get the touch screen, you get to do all this stuff. It, it, it's going to be disintermediating that. It's just going to mm -hmm. be what you think, right? I mean, you can already go out and get you know, these things you put on your head and you can like fly remote control helicopters around the room with your thoughts, right? And, mm -hmm. and that's gonna, it's, we're gonna get there and it's gonna come a lot faster than it took for us to go from having, you know, a, a, a Palm Pilot to a Trio to a BlackBerry to an iPhone to can an iPad, right? Graffiti? Like, <laughs> I don't know, okay, you know, graffiti, I forgot about that. That was the, the thing, right? Is that what that, that was an application card? Is it? Yeah, you are. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of went off on that. You know, we're talking about challenges, but I mean, uh, but I, 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 really, uh, I really think it's opportunities. I mean, and it's just how are companies, this isn't just a quick and loan say, but how are companies going to take advantage of those opportunities, right? I mean, you either can make fun of them and you can say, ah, oh, that's never going to happen. And you can, you know, laugh at people or you could, you know, curl up in a ball and say, we can't do this. Or mm -hmm. you can go out and start to think about the things that are coming down and start to prepare for it. Because if we do go to this like very dynamic broadcast advertising where it's like, you know, one ad for one to one kind of advertising, um, it's going to change the creative process substantially, mm -hmm. and you're you're not going to just create one spot now that you're right. going to go run or two or three. That's you're going to create right hundreds now. of them. It's right? very difficult for most most brands and businesses to figure out how to create content, even just individually for the channel, let alone one to one. Yeah. Just one channel alone is overwhelming for most brands just to make native content for Facebook. Yeah, and the, and, and the appetite for it is almost insatiable mm -hmm. right like that's why i mean at quicken loans our content team has grown by leaps and bounds i mean mm -hmm. it's you know there more content quadruple. people than bankers no there are <laughs> we're not there we still got it we still got to you know like still yeah, 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 you still got to like you still got to close the loans and take care of the client right the content but, right you see three guys <laughs> yeah right but i mean it was you know five years ago it was a team of like a couple right and now it's a team of i don't know it's probably 20 people you know yeah. or something like that right and and so um those are the fundamental things right i mean there's there's a lot of marketing basics right that are always going to apply but um things are changing really quickly and um, you know, we, we have to, because it's such a fun exercise to think about, like, 
what's the next big thing, right? And, and you never know. You, you, you try to imagine it, but I don't know that anybody imagined. Is the, the next this. big things many, 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 many small things? It might be. I don't know. That sounds very profound. Is that ironic or not? <laughs> it's ironic or something. Hey, lastly, last question yeah. I have. Um, so, how do you guys think about how do you guys measure success, right? So, from marketing and social perspective, you know, not picking any particular one, but let's just use digital media. So, how do you guys yeah. measure success? Yeah. So, um, the great thing about digital media, and one thing that I think was stands out that was a little unique about us, is we built our our business primarily on internet marketing and, and digital media. Mm -hmm. uh, it had to do with when. Dan made the decision that like the internet was a thing and this was in like 97 or 98 and he had a manifesto he sent out to people and he said, hey, like this internet is real and this is the future. Um, and so when we went down that path, I mean, he went down the path of basically closing down, he was getting ready to open up branches all over the country, brick and mortars, they pulled the plug on it. And he said, the internet's the future, and, and we went in that direction. And so we built our business with this philosophy of digital first. And so we, you know, at a time when other, our big competitors and other big banks or mortgage companies were spending a lot of money on television and spending a lot of money on direct mail, we weren't. Mm -hmm. We were perfecting the art of digital marketing, I think, mm -hmm. and um, building those channels out. And the great thing about those channels is they're highly measurable, right? At least from a last click perspective. And so, so they're highly measurable. They're highly scalable, all of the things that we value as a business. And we built it in that direction. And then I would say, you know, we, we, we went through some of the challenges with, with the, the, the mortgage, you know, meltdown, as we call it, and some of the challenges around that period of time. And, and around that period of time, when the, when the, you know, the recession hit, a lot of companies that had built their businesses on traditional media started mm -hmm. going into digital. They finally sort of saw the light because it was highly measurable and they didn't want to put it into places where they couldn't. And they started to put their dollars there. And then at that time, we started to actually, we continue to grow our digital, but then we said, look, we have opportunity to go now and go to these other places, right? And so we grew a direct mail program that you know went from nothing to something pretty major. And we started to make investments in television again and, and in brand and, and, and sponsorships and, and sort, of, sort of like when other people were pulling out of those areas, we were going into them. Um, I think NASCAR is interesting. We went into NASCAR, they were really struggling. I mean, it was, they were having a hard time getting sponsors. And so I think that was, uh, we were opportunistic about that and went in at a time when it was when, when we could do it. So, um, so we measure we, we measure pretty much everything on the digital side, from the impressions that we serve up to the clicks and how much the clicks conversion cost and, and the conversion and how much the lead costs. But ultimately, at the end of the day, what we're always measuring um, from a from a revenue perspective, because we measure many other important things like mm -hmm. client care and how are we doing with customer care and stuff like that, is how much revenue do we generate for you know every basically dollar we spend in marketing. Mm -hmm. And um, you ROI. know, your ROI, ROI. it's a ROI. basic ROI, but you know, the, the interesting thing is a lot of companies, and, and we kind of had an epiphany because we did it this way for many, many years, a lot of companies focus on costs, so they do things like a, what is the cost per lead and is it mm -hmm. low enough for me to justify that? It's actually the wrong way to look at things, especially if you have a variable revenue product um, because some, some products that you sell or some leads that you generate uh, or loans you close have much higher revenue. And so you can actually pay more for that. Mm -hmm. And if you're not doing it, if you're not paying more for that, you're missing opportunity, right? Because every additional lead that you get um, that revenue basically drops to the bottom line. And so, um, so, we, we, so that, that is kind of like the way we look at everything. However, um, you know, there's that saying, right, not all that can be measured matters and that not all that matters can be measured. And I think, you know, we've gotten very good at that over the years. And now, sort of like we did with, you know, television and things like that, we're going into areas that are a little less measurable. Social is harder to measure. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It's uncomfortable for me how mm -hmm. difficult it is to measure because I came out of that very highly measurable digital mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Because we because what happens is, is that, you know, so many people are on their mobile device now, they're in Facebook. They see your they might see your ad or your post in the feed, but people don't click out of their mobile app typically because right. the experience isn't very good. Mm -hmm. it takes them into a mobile browser now yeah. and you know, who knows what or it is. Mm -hmm. an ad by accident or yeah, something. and so so what we found is, you know, they come back to you but they don't come back to you. They, it's it's not a lack Last click they come back to you through search or they mm -hmm. come back to you directly to your website or whatever it may be tough to track. it's very it's tough, tough to, track, to cook you right? and tough we're trying to, to figure it out little. and we got some yeah. initiatives going on to do that but um, but that that's you know that's those those are the types of things that that we look at and um, 
you know, the like used to be, you know, used to be something that had some value to it. It has a lot less value now mm -hmm. in Facebook because it's, Facebook's kind of squeezed down on your ability to reach those people. No more, um, people no more yeah, yeah, or and and just if you post something, you just don't reach as many yeah, people. You got, as you got they want it, you to yeah. buy it, you got right? It, yeah. You know, but there's Paul Cheryl Sandberg. Yeah, but on the other hand, you didn't have great targeting with your organic posts yep. in Facebook. And one of the great things is if you do the if you do paid Facebook. You boost. Don't use boost, by the way. You you, you want to go use the power tool editor that they have and actually target it out because mm -hmm. boost boost just kind of Facebook decides who should see it. Mm -hmm. But you can literally target it down to exactly who you want. So if you want to show something just to people in Detroit or just mm -hmm. to LA or whatever, you can do that with the paid. Um, and and so I think it actually opens up some opportunities to be able to do that. So um, th those are those are the kinds of things you know that 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 we measure and. You know, we measure things like you know awareness. Do more people know our name now? Do people what? What do pe how do people feel about us as a business? I mean, those are pretty traditional sentiment, kind of thing, yeah. sentiment brand awareness, um, aided, unaided consideration, stuff like that. All right, Matt Cardwell from Quick and Loans. Thanks for coming on uh, Stream Detroit and the Big Digital Thinkers. Appreciate it. Thanks. Love being here. You guys are great. Really awesome. appreciate it. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Thanks. Appreciate it really, really much. Thanks. All right, let's drink. All right, <laughs> with brisket. <laughs> I don't know if the kitchen's open next door yet. I don't think it is yet. Um, if the, it is, it probably doesn't have brisket. But if it does, I will. What place is in the mood for some brisket now? Um, Cornerstone Barrel House. You oh, I've Oslo. heard about that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 right over there. Yeah, yeah great bourbon selection. Was it also with sushi. Yeah. yeah. So they're going from sushi to brisket. Is what they're going to do? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> right now, it's really not. Nice. <laughs> it's bourbon. As far as Mike and I know. Okay. Yeah, we've never made it past our the bourbon. <laughs> 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 they do have a good, a good whiskey selection. Yeah. Very good. All right. All right.